Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Benjamin Rybeck, and I am the general manager at House of Books here in Kent, Connecticut. And it is uh, a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to this event with Sergio Troncoso to discuss his newest book, A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant's Son. Um, it's always exciting to get to, uh, get to present uh, authors who are based right here in, uh, in our area of Connecticut, our area of the world, of course. Um, and if you'd like to purchase a signed copy of this book, please do so at houseofbookct.com slash troncoso book. That link again is over there in the chat. Um, of course, it's also always a great pleasure for us at House of Books to present these events in partnership with our, uh, with our good friends and, and partners in crime. Uh, down at the Kent Memorial Library. So with that being said, to introduce Sergio more fully this evening, Lucy Pierpont. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you to, to, to you and everyone at the Kent Memorial Library. Thank you. Well, Ben, thanks so much. What a nice welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Lucy Pierpont, as Ben said. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce Amanda Myers right now, who is um, our virtual meeting assistant. Um, if you are having any, if you're having any issues during the meeting, please type it in the chat and she will deal with it with you. Our rules of the road for tonight. The best, please mute and hide your video for tonight's presentation. We will save time at the end for Q&A. If you have a question, please type your question in the chat and we will ask the question on your behalf. At tonight's program, Mr. Troncoso, otherwise known as Sergio, will discuss his newly published work, A Particular Kind of Immigrant Son. Sergio and his family have been patrons of the Kent Memorial Library for many years, and I'm always happy to hear that he has a new book and that it is a winning lots of awards. Sergio is the author of The Last Tortilla and Other Stories, Crossing Borders, Personal Essays, and the novel Nobody's Pilgrims, The Nature of Truth, and From This Wicked Patch of Dust. Among the numerous awards he has won are the K. Catarula, Award for Best Short Story, Premio something Literary Prize, International Latino Book Award for the Best Collection of Short Stories, Southwest Book Award, Bronze Award for Essays from Forward Reviews, and the Silver and Bronze Awards for Multicultural Fiction from Forward Reviews. For many years, he has taught fiction and nonfiction at the Yale Writers Workshop in New Haven, Connecticut. He is president of the Texas Institute of Letters. The son of immigrant, Mexican immigrants, Sergio was born in El Paso, Texas, and now lives in New York City and South Kent. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College and received two graduate degrees in international relations and philosophy philosophy from Yale University. He won a Fulbright scholarship to Mexico where he studied economics, politics, and literature. He was inducted into the Hispanic Scholarship Fund's Alumni Hall of Fame and the Texas Institute of Letters. The El Paso City Council voted unanimously to rename the public library branch as the Sergio Troncoso Branch Library. He has served as a judge for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the New Letters Literacy Award in the essay category. Please join the library and the House of Books in welcoming Sergio Troncoso. Thank you, Lucy. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I wanted to first thank uh, Lucy Pierpont uh, from the Kent Memorial Library and Amanda Myers 
for inviting me, and also Benjamin Rybeck of the House of Books. I hope all of you go and, and, and buy books from the House of Books. I'm a, certainly a, a believer and in, in, in a supporter of independent bookstores and public libraries. That's how I got my start as a writer. So I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about um, my background and, and how I started, and then I'm gonna read a, a little bit from A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son, and then I'm happy to answer any questions about writing or immigrants or uh, you know my, my career or anything on your mind. Uh, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, which is right on the corner uh, next to New Mexico. And uh, in the, in, in both my parents were Mexican immigrants. They came over in the 1950s and became citizens. And we lived in a little hamlet on the outskirts of El Paso called Isleta. And Isleta simply in Spanish means little island. And, and this, um, this little hamlet was actually smaller than Kent. It actually had about 2,000 people. There was a horse farm behind us and cotton fields all around us. And uh, my parents built their own house. So we, uh, we moved into our, our lot and our half-built home before it was finished. We had uh, an outhouse in the backyard and uh, kerosene lamps and stoves. And uh, we didn't have, um, you know, running water until later uh, over time in the 60s, the, the El Paso the city kept growing and annexed this little hamlet uh, on the border uh, called Isleta, where I, where I was growing up. And as I have described it to many people in talks I've, I've given, it was sort of a, a Tom Sawyer-ish uh, lifestyle, but uh, the Mexican version of it. I would go and fish in the canals behind their house and in different places nearby, and I would bring back dead rattlesnakes from, from the cotton field. Um, and, and I think it was when people know how I grew up, and as I said sometimes uh, facetiously in, in, in talks, um, we were so close to Mexico, to, to quote uh, Tina Fey as Sarah Palin, that I could see Mexico from my house. So we were probably a quarter of a mile from Mexico. We were in Texas and everybody in our community in Isleta was, was Mexican and, and not, not Mexican American, not uh, Hispanic. These were people who had just crossed over, had jobs or and, you know, not trying to get their green cards or like my parents got their green cards and became citizens. And so, and everybody was building their own homes and exchanging work and, and just trying to survive really in a, in a, in a, in a very difficult uh, environment because it was very poor. And so people ask, well, when they find out how I grew up, how did you end up at Harvard and then went to Yale? And I teach now at the Yale uh, Writers Workshop. And, and I think one of the things I would tell them is, is that the, the, one of the uh, what my parents taught me was these this work ethic, this unbelievable focused work ethic um, that propelled me over time. And I'll give you some examples just to, 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 to give you a flavor. When we were small, uh, every time after school, we would get out at 3.30 or so, and, and I started kindergarten in English in, in, a, in the local Texas school. Um, after we finished school, my father would take us to do construction work. And this was for three or four hours. We were either building our own, another bathroom in our house or putting up the roof. And we were doing it ourselves. And, and, uh, and this also included Saturdays and Sundays. So it was years and years of, of hard work. And I also had to do very well in school. My, my, just to give you another example, my, my mother would take us uh, Saturdays and Sundays sometimes to the back of our house to clean the irrigation canal behind their house. Now we didn't own the canal, but he said it's good for the neighborhood, we should do this. And so this, this kind of work ethic and, and focus on community and focus on, on lifting yourself up from your bootstraps are the values that propelled me eventually to, um, you know, to, to move beyond where, where I started. So my parents were disciplinarians. They were tough on us. 
and um, and and not surprisingly, of course, all of my siblings, um, not just only graduated from high school, but they all graduated from college, and they all have graduate degrees. So I wasn't the only one, but it, it really began with my parents focused on on this incredible work ethic that they taught us. Now, now, not everyone in our community, of course, had this mentality. There were certainly a lot of um, immigrants, Mexican immigrants, you know, that were into drugs. There were gangs in our neighborhood. There were fights. But one of the, the things I, I, I tell people through my writing and certainly when people invite me to, to speak is that um, when you look at a poor community, and it doesn't matter if that poor community is white or if it's Mexican-American or Mexican or if it's African-American, within each family, there are very different cultures and values and, and that's what is more difficult to really discern. You have to get within the families to understand uh, what's happening in that family, whether that family has this, this uh, work ethic and this focus on religion, like my mother. My mother is, is certainly uh, very Catholic and, and taught us to be, um, you know, to be uh, very Catholic ourselves. And I think that that kind of moral foundation also helped me. And then there are other families next door that were also Mexican, that were very different from us, that were, you know, into drugs or into gangs, uh, or, um, you know, or, or having uh, domestic issues. And so, and so I think, you know, we'll, too often, I think we see poor communities, and we want to put a broad brushstroke on them and say to them uh, that they're all the same, or everyone is pretty similar. And, and that's really not true. It, you know, in my community and in, in how we grew up, there were uh, Felix Saldivar, a friend of mine, became a county judge. There was a, a, a girl from uh, one street over, Carranza, who, Noni, who became a, a prince high school principal. I became a writer. And so you had these examples within families that were doing it the right way, despite the poverty, despite sometimes the, the, the somewhat violence uh, and drug abuse around us. Um, and, and I think one of the, 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 the reasons my parents focused on our, on, on our work was so that we would not get involved in any of this um, as we were growing up. So, so for me, when I, and, and people often ask me, well, how did you become a writer from all of this? So I had two big influences in my life that, that affected me. On, on writing. Um, the, the first one was my, and probably my muse, and the person I still write about is my abuelita, my grandmother, my, my mother's mother. Her name was Doña Dolores Rivero, or Doña Lola, Miss Lola. Uh, and she was this tough as nails older lady that had survived the Mexican Revolution um, family lore was that she had shot and killed two men who attempted to rape her in 1915, 1916, when she was a teenager. And so this, this lady, this, uh, my grandmother, lived about 50 miles away in downtown El Paso. And I would bike from Isleta all the way to downtown El Paso to hear these stories about the Mexican Revolution, sometimes very violent, exciting, you know, as a kid. I, 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 uh, I, I love these kinds of stories. Um, and she also had no filters. So she would tell you exactly what, what she was happening and whether I should have been listening to it as a kid or not, um, she would say it. And um, she was also a great oral storyteller. So she would sit on her porch drinking her coffee, um, smoking her cigarette, and, uh, and, and the neighborhood would come, sometimes 10, sometimes 15 people. And Saturday nights, I would be, I would stay over at my grandmother's and listen to these stories with the entire neighborhood there, or a, a big part of the neighborhood there, um, till two or three in the morning. So this oral storytelling became for me infectious and something exciting. And as I tell my older kids now, I had two boys, uh, it was sort of the, the, the violent stories were like Call of Duty Mexican style. And, and so my grandmother um, was, was such an important figure in, in my life as, as a writer. In fact, the very first story I wrote in, in my first book, The Last Tortilla, that won the Premio Aslan or the Aslan Prize for best book by a new Mexican-American writer, 
uh, was called the abuelita or the grandmother. And, and I wanted people to get to know this kind of strong character who survived difficult moments in life, who had a lot to teach other people, who had a lot to teach people about character and perseverance and grit. And if you looked at it from afar, you would just see a poor Mexican woman in a tenement, you know, smoking her cigarette and, and telling stories. And may, maybe you wouldn't pay attention to her. But, but one of the things I, I noticed about my grandmother is that she really was a teacher. She wanted to teach people how to succeed through difficulty, through, through problems. And, um, and when I, for example, uh, went to Harvard, and for me, going to Harvard was like going to Mars. Um, I had never been to Massachusetts. I'd never visited the school. This was before the Common App, before um, the internet, really. And, and some of my counselors said, well, you have the grades and you have the, the, the writing abilities. You might, you might be able to get into an Ivy League school. I didn't know what the Ivy League school was. And when I got to Harvard, um, as I was arriving uh, on Logan Airport, and I, I arrived by myself. My parents uh, only came to Harvard once when I graduated, but the rest of the four years, I arrived by myself doing everything myself. And the, the cab driver was driving me into Harvard Square. I thought he was kidnapping me. Uh, I thought Harvard Square was a park. And I told him, why are you taking me to a park? You're supposed to be taking me to my school. And he said, no, no, this is Harvard. Harvard is all around you. And I, it never occurred to me that Harvard would be amongst trees and it would be so green and, and look like a park. And so I, I was really clueless. Uh, I arrived at Harvard um, with bell-bottom jeans and uh, Led Zeppelin t-shirts, and I didn't know it got cold in, in Boston. So I didn't have a, a, a winter coat. I had to buy a used coat from, from a, a place called Keezer's, a used clothing store. And, and when I called my abuelita, this woman who, that had such a profound effect on my life, and I, and I told her the first week, I said, I want to quit. I don't think I belong here. Everybody tells me I have an accent. There are no Mexicans here. And you know, sometimes you would be made to feel less. I certainly was not a rich school prep, prep kid. I was the opposite. Um, my grandmother said, you know, on the phone, she said, Sergio, don't come back with your tail between your legs. Show them who you are. And this kind of backbone, this grit, this toughness, is what eventually helped me overcome a lot of difficulties and, and acclimations and cultural shock at, at, at Harvard um, and, and, and really became, um, you know, the reasons why I became a writer. I wanted to show people these values that came from my family, from Mexican immigrants, that helped me translate these values into academic success at places like Harvard and Yale. And so, um, and so it, it's, it's one of the reasons why I often write about crossing borders. And it's, it's not just crossing borders, literally physical international borders, but it's also linguistic borders, psychological borders, even borders here in Kent, where if you've never met a Mexican immigrant and you have an idea, a stereotype of who you think a, a Mexican immigrant is, and then you meet me, so often people tell me, well, you don't act like a Mexican immigrant. So it's, I'm, I'm challenging the, the border they created around their own psychology about what an immigrant should be. And, and I think so crossing borders is not just about the immigrant coming and, and acclimating to America, but it's also about all of us who are you know, Americans and proudly so. Um, crossing borders to understand uh, the variety in, in different families and the variety in immigrants and appreciate what, you know, what they might bring to the table. And, and something I've argued before is I've given a lot of lectures that the immigrants like my parents in many ways are renewing what the pilgrims did, the values, these fundamental values of, of pulling yourself up from your bootstraps in difficult situations of fighting for your spot uh, in a hostile environment, whether that's New England, you know, in the 1600s or 1500s, or it's, um, you know, a little hamlet along the border. And, 
and and it's it's um, you know it's something that we can all learn from, and and remember what it is to be this pioneering American, which is certainly how I have felt uh, for most of my life. So let me tell you a little bit about this new book, and then I'm going to read a piece, and um, I'd love to open that up to questions because I love to teach, and I, I've been teaching now. And by the way, we've been in Kent, Connecticut for 14 years. And I love Kent. One of the reasons I love Kent so much was because it reminds me a lot of the rural nature, the rural quality, the people, the friendliness of, of a place like Isleta. I mean, it's very different from Isleta. Of course, in Isleta, it's all Mexican immigrants, but it's definitely rural. It's definitely surrounded by farms. And, and I love um, that aspect of, of Kent, that it really is a, a small town in a community that I hope you know, will uh, will always be welcoming to to people who are who are coming from the outside. And of course, my wife also loves gardening, so this is a terrific place for her. So this this book that just came out, a peculiar kind of immigrant son, um, it uh, it won some nice awards already, and um, and it's a collection of linked short stories, and all focused on immigration. And one of the one of the things that I didn't mention, but at Yale, when I finished at Harvard, I went to Yale and I got a couple of graduate degrees. Is I studied philosophy, and learned German, and and went to Austria and, and studied uh, German philosophers like Nietzsche and Heidegger and Wittgenstein, and and uh, that was one of my graduate degrees at Yale. So I wanted to cross that border to not just you know uh, be good at what I was doing uh, in in my field in, in the United States, but also internationally. And, and so I'm really interested in perspectivism. And that's that basically we're all different selves. I'm the self, that poor boy that grew up along the border. I'm also a guy that now teaches at Yale. I'm also somebody who loves to chop wood in Kent, Connecticut. And so we're all a composite of so many different historical and linguistic and psychological selves. And so I'm playing with this issue of perspectivism in this collection. So you'll see at the very beginning in the table of contents, you'll see the stories are, are grouped together in, in, I don't know if you can see it, in twos and threes. And so one character will appear from one angle and then you'll read the, the next story and it'll appear, that same character will reappear from a different angle. And you'll, you'll ask yourself, well, who really is this character that I thought I knew from this story, but then in this next story, he's a different person. He's the same character, but you're seeing him from through somebody else's eyes, or perhaps instead of being home in Texas, you're seeing him uh, in Connecticut, for example. And so, so this issue of perspectivism plays throughout the book. Um, and as you go through the book, it starts with realistic stories and ends up with surreal um, stories and and somewhat a dystopian uh, a dystopian uh, America in which uh, things are sort of falling apart and there somebody has discovered this sanctuary called Library Island uh, in which in in order to enter this sanctuary you have to go through a, a grueling gauntlet of reading uh, almost reading as torture and if anybody wants to ask me how I got the idea for that. Uh, you, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to answer that, that, that question. So anyway, so the, sto the stories are about immigration, but it's also a philosophical and um, uh, story collection, much like, I don't know if any of you remember Pink Floyd, The Wall. It's sort of a, a, a concept album on perspectivism and immigration. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's doing some unusual things at a certain point in this collection, the reader him or herself becomes a character in the story that you are reading. And this, this happens toward the surreal part of the, of the book toward the end. So it's doing some unusual things. And I think that's why some writers really enjoy um, this collection. So let me just read now and, uh, and then we'll get into your questions. So this, this first, I'm just gonna read from the first story. It's, it's somewhat autobiographical. It's called Rosary on the Border. And this, um, this man who's about 50 years old, he's returning to Texas to bury his father. And uh, he's traveled 
a long distance away from home, away from El Paso. And he's trying to figure out what did, what did this all mean? This traveling, this moving to so, such a different place from where he started. And, and, and this, this death of his father has brought back all of these feelings about where he belongs, who is he now? What did his father mean to him? And so the section I'm reading is this re recollection of when David was 21 and um, he uh, was at Logan Airport with his parents and he had just graduated from school and, um, and they're having a fight. And so this is, this is that section in the, in the first story. Decades ago, when I graduated from college, in fact, the only time mom and dad ever visited Boston, we were at South Station, the three of us sitting on a long wooden bench. I remember it was smoky, or at least dust hung in the sun's rays through the air. We were having a fight, or at least I was fighting with them. Commencement had been the day before, and I had accompanied them to Amtrak because they were on their way to DC to make this trip a kind of vacation. Smiling in a smirky way, my father had quizzed me about what I would do now with a college degree in poli sci. And when I would start work, he bragged about how he had survived alone in Juarez after my culo grandfather had slapped $20 into his palm and sent him out the door. I think my father always believed I was too soft, too emotional, not his kind of son, not the Mexican macho he adored in Uncle Dago, and not the servant he saw in my brother, Adan, not the athlete he admired in Pablo. I was a strange creature who would and would not do what he wanted, who questioned his values to his face, who had created opportunities he only dreamed about who had finished an American college degree in an American city, as strange as Moscow would have been to any of us. As we sat on that wooden bench and waited for their train, my mother defended my ambiguity, defended my wanting to keep searching for what I truly wanted, which of course, like any smart ass 21 year old, I could not articulate very well. This college, this city had opened my eyes beyond Isleta beyond El Paso, beyond the border desert. And now just working to pay the bills seemed like a prison to me. I knew I would not be able to think, and that's what I had relished in college for the first time in my life, a certain openness to my life that I did not want to close. His life had been defined by what he had to do. Mine would be, I hoped, by what I could do. In his life, he had fantasized about becoming a doctor and forever blamed his father for giving him nothing to achieve that goal. In my life, I had taken a rash leap away from home, made my way with little interference from my parents and would not give up on my nascent dream. My father criticized my indecisiveness, my wasting time at school without having a plan. It was more than he didn't want to pay the bills. And really, he hadn't paid the bills. I had worked every summer, work study every academic year. I had taken shitloads of student loans. And yes, mom and dad had sent me hundreds of dollars here and there. But I had carried the load to what I think he saw as a wild gambit in Boston, to the strange, faraway New England school without Mexicans. At graduation, my parents had been the foreigners much darker than everybody else, with awkward accents, intimidated next to my roommates, friends, and their casually suburban parents. It wasn't the money. It was another of my weaknesses. That's what he used against me at South Station. His green eyes glinted like the edges of Damascus steel, a snide little comment that sliced between my ribs like a switchblade about my girlfriend, Jean, a blue-eyed beauty from Concord, Massachusetts, my lovely and loving Jean, who had sought them out with her college Spanish and laughed heads together with my mother. Jean, who was 
had accompanied me to El Paso for Thanksgiving my senior year, Jean, who was more delicate and sophisticated than the richest Anglo girl they had ever come across in El Paso, Texas. My father at South Station. Why would Jean want to stay with someone who doesn't know what he's doing, who doesn't have a job? It's time to stop living in a fantasy world. It's time to be a man. I hated him for pitying what he imagined Jean was and what he believed I would never be. I hated him for not believing in me. I hated him for not giving me another chance. I hated him for wanting to slam the door shut on what I could be. I told my mother because I knew it would hurt her. And I told my father too, because he was next to her. I told them I had always felt abandoned and adopted, that they had always favored my brothers and my sister, that I knew I wasn't loved by them in Isleta. I was shouting at them, even as hot tears slashed across my cheeks. I didn't care that a few others turned to stare at us in that waiting room cavern. I didn't care about the propriety or impropriety of what others thought of me, unlike my father. It was a moment when I had felt the most alone in my life, more than that first day as a freshman, when I had stumbled with my old suitcases into the dingy one-room cell carrying two dozen flautas wrapped in foil from Isleta. The road, too, had once been in dark exile in Hollis Hall. I was that iconoclast's Mexican brother. Only a few minutes to go and they would have to leave for their train. I wanted to punch my father. My mother in tears said, of course she loved me. My father held back, embarrassed, watching both of us as if we were insane, he averting his green eyes from mine. Waiting for him to stand up, I stared through him, my chest heaving in spasms. My mother's hand reached to hold mine, to calm me. I believed and did not believe what I had said. I still wanted to punch him. I had felt so alone for so many years. Part of it was what I had done by leaving home. Part two was having never felt at home in Isleta. Then my father inhaling, finally meeting my eyes again said, we love you, David, but sometimes we didn't know what to do with you. You are not like any of us. I think my father said those words because he never wanted to see my mother in pain. I think he said them because he didn't want to see his grown son angry and out of control at South Station, surrounded by strangers. He may have even meant what he said too. I don't know. We said our goodbyes. I hugged and kissed both of them politely. My head throbbed. I was alone, and I had always been alone, and they had been together and would always be together. It took me years to understand what this meant. I made many decisions, some awful and others brilliant, but I found ways to keep that openness in my soul that meant more to me than breathing. I told them over the years what I was doing, how I was trying what no one in my family had ever tried to do. When I was failing, I admitted that as well, and they listened politely. I also knew that's all they could do. One lonely night in Connecticut, I pulled myself from a window of ledge. No one else next to me. Another day, I chose to do something someone like me should have never accomplished, and yet I did, and kept going. I learned to recognize when others, like Jean, were much better than me, because they had faith in my soul. I believed in very little, but I kept going until I would get tired or defeated, and then I would take time to discover another wall to throw myself at. I was, and I am, and I will be, a peculiar kind of immigrant son. I got old, and that made everything better, including me. Thank you. So that's a snippet from the first story of a peculiar kind of immigrant son. Um, 
So I'm happy now to, to answer questions if people have questions. Um, also, the second person I didn't mention who had a big influence on in my life, uh, other than my grandmother in terms of my writing, is my grandfather uh, on my father's side, my paternal grandfather. His name was Santiago Troncoso. He was a very well-known uh, Mexican journalist. He has actually a boulevard named after him in Juarez, Mexico. So if, so if there's such a thing as a writing gene, I probably got it from him. So please uh, ask me questions if you, if you have about writing or my work or anything else on your mind. Well, well, Sergio, we have one comment. It's not a question, but Joseph Dwyer says, great story, thanks. Thank you, Joseph. I, and, hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And, and I sure liked it too, it was really good. Yeah, and by the way, that story was the one that won the Catarula Award for best short story um, from the Texas Institute of Letters. So that was great. It came with a nice check too. Um, somebody's asking, you said you have two influences. Your, hmm. My abuelita and who was the other one? Yeah. And right, so the, the, the second person was my grandfather, my, my paternal grandfather. He, his name was Santiago Troncoso. And, and he, he was this rabble rousing Mexican journalist in the 1920s and 30s. He was publisher and editor of the first daily newspaper in Juarez, Mexico. And by the way, if you've never been to El Paso and Juarez, El Paso and Juarez are, are, are basically one city divided by a little canal. The Housatonic is gigantic compared to the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande is more like a canal. And so it's, it's like, uh, you know, uh, Warren being right next to Kent. That's how close Juarez and, and El Paso are. And so my, my grandfather, who was this big journalist in in, in Mexico in the 20s and 30s, uh, he would write against Mexican uh, government corruption and he was thrown in jail something like 38 times. Um, eventually, he, uh, when he retired, they put up a statue of him in Juarez uh, of the freedom of the press. On, and so he's one of the three signatories to the freedom of the press statue. So once he was uh, retired and gone and not a problem, they, of course, made him into a hero, but when he was alive, they, they hated his guts. Uh, and so he told me when I was a, a high schooler and I was um, thinking of being a writer, he said, uh, don't become a journalist because if you tell, don't become a writer because if you tell the truth, people will hate you forever. So I, of course, ignored it, but, but, uh, but that was his advice because he had a hard life as a, as a writer. Here's another question. Um, my, my, my abuelita, the one who was so important to me, she was my mother's mother. And she, and, and by the way, in this collection, uh, I know I think it was uh, Jeffrey and, and Lisa are asking me this question. She, my grandmother reappears in the last story or a version of her really called Eternal Return in which this guy is coming back and talking to his dead grandmother. Like I hear my grandmother's voice in my head all the time, the, the advice she gave me about succeeding, the advice she gave me about being moral, even when nobody's watching you, uh, the advice about fighting for what you want. And so it, she's very present in my mind, although she, you know, she's been gone for a long time and she died when, while I was at Harvard. And that's probably one of the greatest regrets I have about leaving home that I didn't get to spend um, more time with my grandmother because she was, you know, um, and still is probably in many ways more important than my, my parents were. Um, let's see, we have another question. Thank you for the reading. How are you approaching your writing practice and taking care of yourself during this especially difficult time? Well, that's a really good question. So, so COVID, you know, as, as I've told my wife, uh, I've been practicing social distancing for about 30 years uh, as a writer. <laughs> you know, as a writer, it's, it's a very, uh, other, you know, it's, when you're not teaching, of course, you're sitting in front of a computer working out a story or a character or trying to hash out a new story. I just sent out a new story yet last night, for example. So, so for me, it's been, uh, it's been difficult 
because I'm not teaching and I love to teach and, and I'm doing some teaching online, but it's not the same. Um, but I've been remarkably productive. And so I, I have, um, with all this time here, and when, I, when I'm doing a, teach, uh, a, a talk or, or teaching, I simply sit in front of my computer instead of driving an hour and getting lesson plans and all of that. So I save a lot of time. So I'm, I'm coming out with two books next year, uh, a new novel uh, called Nobody's Pilgrims and um, a new anthology in which I'm the main editor uh, of, of, um, of, of literature. And so that's coming out in the next year. So for, so for me, it's been sort of isolating, but I'm used to it as a writer. Uh, I can't wait to get back to teaching. And I love teaching at Yale. I'm, I'm, I'm very tough on my students. I expect them to work really hard. But I also love my students when they produce work and they take it to another level. And I, I tell them, I, I will only give you as much work as I will be doing myself. And, and by the way, I, I, don't, I don't wanna brag too much, but my students have won the biggest prizes of all the teachers in our program, the Yale Writers Workshop, because I really, I, they start working in my class about a month before the class starts. I have, ex yes, exactly. I have exercises and they, if they're gonna join my class, I'm gonna take their writing to another level, but they have to do the work on dialogue, on setting, on, on language. And I'm meticulous about going through their work and giving them comments. And, uh, and, and when, they're, when they're done, if they can survive, uh, I'm, I'm their best uh, mentor and advocate, but I want them to do the work because there's no substitute for putting in the time and doing the work and the rewrite after rewrite after rewrite. And that, that's really how you become a really good writer. Um, and sometimes people think it's just sitting around and you know, moving your hand over the keyboard. <laughs> and it's a lot of work. It's a lot more work than that. Oh, so right. some, somebody's saying they're from El Paso. Yeah. Um, oh, they're I, Valle. That's, that's very close to my mother's house. By the way, my mother still lives in the same adobe house that we, we built. Do you want me to read you the comment? Uh, you well, I'm, I'm looking at it, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, Isleta High School and Del Valle are basically two schools next to each other. And, uh, and my mother lives uh, in a walking distance from Del Valle High School. So that's terrific. Um, yikes. The comments are going, coming fast now. Um, let me just go back up to a remark about your reading. So poignant, I can so relate. It describes my relationship with my parents, bravo. And then, well, and, uh, you know, that, so somebody asked where they could take a course with me. Mm -hmm. so if you go to the Yale Writers Workshop at the, the website, just type in Yale um, Writers Workshop in Google, and and you'll see uh, and and you'll see see when I'm when I'm teaching a class. I'm I'm typing it in right now. There you go. Um, and it's also if you want to see my. Um, my website where I have all sorts of interviews from NPR, et cetera. Um, you can also see them there as well. Uh, I don't know if other people have other questions or maybe you have a question, Lucy. Well, well, I do have a question. It's about what you were talking about before you started the reading about the library um, island, was it? Oh, right. So, so another story in this collection is called Library Island. And so toward the end of the collection, it, it takes a dystopian turn. And, and so the, the America I'm describing is this America in which people are not reading and people are not losing that capacity to, to have complex thoughts. And of course, you know, it sort of mirrors what's happening now where people think in Twitter, you know, writing a couple of sentences, that's your opinion. Um, and I sort of laugh at that because in philosophy at Yale, for example, we would spend sometimes uh, three months on two or three paragraphs in Aristotle. And, you know, that's close reading. So, so this in Library Island, uh, as, this, as this dystopian country is falling apart, uh, uh, the, the main character finds out that there's this sanctuary called Library Island and it's hidden in the West. And the only way you can reach it 
is by uh, first trying to stumble your way there. And then once you get there, you have to go through a series of reading tests, a grueling reading test. And, uh, and then only if you survive these tests in which you're getting um, boxes of 25 books every 10 days, uh, you have to read them. You have to tell people what they're about, the interlocutor, what they're about. And if you don't, then something awful will happen to you. And so this, there's this, this quest to get to Library Island, this, this place where, where people are reading and, and trying to prevent the outer world, which is what I call it, from infringing. And this outer world, uh, outer world is full of nihilism and people who don't read and can't think anymore because they're too busy on things like this. Um, and so anyway, the, the, I got that idea from being a judge at the Penn Faulkner. <laughs> um, when the, the Penn Faulkner um, is the, the, um, the, other than the Pulitzer Prize, in fact, more people submit to the Penn Faulkner than to the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, my, the year that I was selected as a judge, uh, you had three national judges. We had to read 493 books in about nine months. That's about two books a day. Um, you have to read and they're coming at you and everybody from Joyce Carol Oates to Stephen King to you name it, they, who if they produced a book that year, they're, they're submitting it to the Penn Faulkner. It's a very difficult prize to win. And, um, and so as a judge, you know, you're only asked to do this maybe once in your lifetime. Um, I don't think anyone's ever been asked to judge twice. And so I was asked in 2016, and you want to do a good job. So I was reading my butt off. Uh, in fact, my wife got me this special chair where I was sitting in my chair something like 16, 18 hours a day just reading. Because, of course, I would have to have these uh, meetings and conversations and exchange six-page emails with the other two judges who are also, you know, uh, wonderful writers. And I wanted to make sure I was doing my work. And so, so it's sort of terrifying and they pay you for these nine months. So I, I wasn't teaching because you can't teach really. Um, and, and you have all these deadlines when to turn in your, 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 you know, your top 20 and then they're announced to the New York Times and the Washington Post and then your, your five finalists and then your winner. And um, so it's, it's sort of a, an amazing experience. And one of the things this, this incredible amount of reading does, it sharpens your voice. I can tell you, you give me a novel, I can tell you within the first two or three pages what mistakes this writer is doing in terms of character, in terms of setting, or the language not being precise enough. And so to, to get to the last five from 493, everything has to be working right from, from the, the, the rhythm of the, each sentence to the construction of the sentence, to the perspective, to the language, to the characterization of the, of the, of the protagonist or protagonist in the, in the novel or short story collection. And, and it just makes you sharper as a writer. Um, and I, I, can I, do I have, I'm gonna tell you a little story about what happened at the end of this, because uh, something very exciting happened that's never happened before. So we're, I'm, I'm discussing this these, uh, this, these avalanche of books coming at me every, every uh, 10 days. And, and I'm discussing it with, with two other writers and we're the ones who will make the decision. So we, we had uh, come down to the last 30 and all of us agreed these are the 30 best of the 493 that were submitted that year. And so then I said, I, and you, you have to agree with the judges to do everything together. So I said, I'm gonna put everybody on a spreadsheet. So without telling me, Molly and Abby, the other two writers, who your number one is, you rank them from one to 30. And I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm not gonna tell the other two judges how I'm ranking them. And then on a certain day, at a certain time, because we were in different time zones, one of them was in London, another one was in Wisconsin, and I was here in Kent. Um, I said, we'll, we will exchange lists. And so my number one will get, let's say 30 points and Molly's number one will get 30 points and so et cetera. And, and num my number two will get 29 points, et cetera. So once we put all these lists together, we'll have a common five, simply on a number system, right? And they, they agreed to do this. 
So without telling each other who, how, how we were ranking the books, we, we turned in the list and they turned them in to me and, and I just, I put them all on the spreadsheet and, and sent it back to them quickly. This is the remarkable thing that happened. So we had a common five based on this system that I devised. We had a common five in which, you know, all of us had gotten the most uh, points for those common five. So every judge had four of their individual five in the common five uh, tabulation. So we had very, I may have put uh, my number two, uh, you know, I may have put uh, my number, uh, you know, X, Y, Z as number two, and Molly may have put them in number three, but we had very similar sensibilities in, in terms of what were the aesthetic quality that makes a great work. And, and let me and they tell you the most astonishing thing that happened. So then we choose our, our winner, who's James Hanahan, who wrote Delicious Foods, a great uh, work. Um, and and you, you can look it up, it won in 2016. And we also had our other four who also get prizes from the Penn Faulkner Foundation. So three weeks later, after we had already announced it, after they're already in the newspaper, one of our five wins the Pulitzer. So we had the Pulitzer before the Pulitzer Prize Committee. So we did our job. I mean, we busted our ass. We, we read until we almost dropped. Uh, and that was the first time in Penn Faulkner history that at the uh, Folger Shakespeare Library uh, in, in Washington, when they had the Penn Faulkner Award winner and giving his talk, that they also, among the five, had also won the Pulitzer. First time, and we got it. And, and by the way, one of the odd things that happened is that I lost feeling in my right leg from reading so much, and I called it my Penn Faulkner blood clot. Uh, and they got a little nervous, you know, when I told them about this, but then it, it, it all came back uh, after I stopped reading so much. Um, and, uh, but I was, I was proud that, that the, the judges had done a great job of picking the best five books of that year. And, and we did it the right way, but it's, but it's brutal work, I think. And that's, and that's where I got the idea for Library Island, by the way. Reading is torture. Yeah, sounds like prison. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I, hope, I, I wonder if anyone else has questions. Um, yeah, but, uh, well, let's see, there was a question up there from Joseph Dwyer saying, I think immigrants, which my family were from Ireland, Make America strong. Sad. So the, go ahead. Sad, given the current administration's view of immigrants. Talk about your view of immigrants in America, if you would. Well, you know, I mean, my, my view of immigrants, of course, is, is, is affected by my family. And, and I think one of the things I would say to people is give them a chance especially if you, uh, you know, if you see a poor neighborhood like Isleta or a poor family like uh, my family was uh, and my grandmother was, they might actually be able to teach you something about uh, reinvigorating your traditional American values if you just paid attention and listened to them. And, and I think that's one thing that, that I, that's why I started writing, because I felt that people, if people read about my abuelita, my mother's mother, and understood what she went through and how she survived and became, you know, a great grandmother, at least to me, that they would learn about their own struggles of survival and, and, and be helped by, by someone like her. And so I wanted her in literature. I wanted her in libraries and, and universities. And, and too often, I think we, we see immigrants and we put them with a broad brushstroke they're all like this. They're all drug users or they're all gangsters. Or, and we had all of that in our neighborhood, but we weren't. And so I think you, you had to be a little bit more critical and looking at the, the families that are doing it the right way and, and, and want to be here. And, are, and, you know, we qualified for welfare and food stamps. And my parents said, no, we're not taking it. It's disgraceful. We're not, we're not accepting that. So there are many families, Mexican immigrants families, who are like that. So if I have any view on immigration, it would be for uh, a white audience or an audience that's not Mexican to look at the particular immigrant that's in front of you. Try to find out who they are, what's motivating them, and, and give them a chance, certainly if they deserve 
that chance and if they've proven themselves to to deserve that chance because there are a lot of us like this so that's that would be um you know my my view of immigrants to so just give them a chance to don't paint them with a broad brush stroke but be specific um i noticed somebody asked who are the other five books so the other five books uh the one that won the pulitzer that we had chosen is Viet Tan wen the sympathizer that's the one that won the, the pulitzer Another book was um, by, I'm trying to remember uh, my memory, um, Mendo, what is it called? Mendocino Fire? Um, Mendocino Fire. Um, and another one was The Water Stories. I think Luis Alberto Urea. Um, trying to think of who else was in that, in that five. Oh, um, it was, um, uh, Doctor, Doctor by Julie uh, Urumaya, uh, who's uh, I think Nigerian, a N Nigerian American, and she wrote a great, um, a, a great novel about immigrants, um, you know, in in middle class and midwestern America. I think that I think that's everybody. I'm trying to remember, uh, but I can if you send me an email, just send me an email at. at you know my name dot com. I can give you a list of the of the. Um, I'm, I'm putting in my email. Uh, I'm, I'll send you a list of the of the five books that won that year. Any other questions? Somebody said something, but I'll let you read it. Okay. Uh, okay. What a great story! Good vibe from El Paso. Wow, Austin High School. That's terrific. That's the high school in El Paso. That's very exciting. So I'm gonna have a few El Paso events coming up uh, pretty soon. All of it, of course, is on my website. Um, are there, I mean, what, what kind of um, immigrant community do we have in Kent? I mean, I know, you know, the, the, all the, my friends at the Villager, um, you know, Tony and his wife and, and Omar and all the, all the people who work there, and they've always been very friendly. Um, and I know a few others here and there. I don't know if it's uh, common to have a lot of different kind of immigrants, whether it's Latin American immigrants or, or from other places. What is your view of that, Lucy? I, you, I think we're probably all immigrants. Um, at some do, you, do, you, do you get people who ask for Spanish language books at the Kenner um, Library? Or not too often? I'm not sure. Um, they don't ask me. Um, sorry, I don't, they don't ask me, so I don't really know. I'm sure that if we had a Spanish class, we'd have some people taking You know, he, here's, I'm going to propose something because uh, one, one person, I, don't, I forgot, who, I would love to take a, a class with you at Yale, right? Somebody said that. If you, if we can organize it, Lucy, I could do like a one or two session writing workshop just for the Kent Memorial Library. How about that? Sounds good. And, sure. and you know, we'll, we'll just, we'll organize it maybe in a month or so. And, and we can talk about writing, the craft of writing, writing a short story. Um, and, cool. and I would, you know, I do it simply because I love public libraries. I want to support the Kent Memorial Library. And I also, you know, want people to support the House of Books you know, and, and keep these independent bookstores thriving. Yes. Um, because if you want independent voices, you get them through the House of Books, through people like the House of Books. Sure. So I'll, I'll do a workshop, maybe, you know, one or two sessions, and we can talk about short stories and writing and, and novels, and, um, and I'd love to do it. Let's talk about it. Okay. How about that? I think that sounds excellent. Great. And this has been one of the the best book talks I've ever attended. Yeah, and I mean, and if you want, we could limit it to just Kent residents, or I don't know if that's being too exclusionary. That's not fair. <laughs> I'll do it for anybody. You, you decide how to do it. Well, if we do it on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, no, let's do it. Two the and we can talk about writing, and I'm happy to help people with their writing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and people are saying, fabulous idea.
Thanks, Sergio. I'm not from Kent, but would love to sign up for the writing workshop. Okay. Well, Keep watching our website, okay? Yeah, Lucy will Lucy will be in charge and you'll, yeah. you'll tell me. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I'd love to do it. And I have exercises. People can work on dialogue. People can work on setting. And, um, and I can, you know, we, you know, I'll, we'll do like a, an hour, two hour session. Look, at, I think you already have a class. <laughs> well, you, you know, better I, start them working now. I just want to help people. And I love teaching, frankly. And, uh, and so for me, interacting with the community is always the best thing, best part of my day. And Kent loves you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm telling you, some of the, some, there's great eating in Kent, Kingsley and all of those, and the villager, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, on that note, uh, the House of Books and the Kent Memorial Library sure have enjoyed having you. Yeah, and I will sign uh, any books that the House of Books tells me. So if they tell me, you know, a few people ordered the book, I will go there and sign it. And if you want me to sign it to you, just tell the House of Books or, or tell Lucy uh, tell to do House it that way. And I'm happy to do it that way as well. When you're ordering your book from the House of Books, just mention that, that you want a special signature. Or dedication or whatever. Yeah, dedication. Okay. Thank, wow, someone's thanking me. Thank you, Joseph. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, I think we should show everybody so we can all have a round of applause. Thank you all for coming. Gracias. And let's let's do a workshop. I'd love to do a Kent workshop. Yeah. Okay. Great, great to hear from you, Sergio. <laughs> hey, is that you, Peter? That's me. Now it's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Did your head. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I had a little bit of a medical thing today, so. I'm, uh, well, you look great. You look great. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, you know, we'll work out the details of the workshop and then people yeah. can sign up online and we'll put it all on, yeah. on the Ken Memorial Library page. Hey, hello. hello. Hi. Hello. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Been fun. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Hello. Oh, crazy here. So, Lucy, you'll make the announcement on the uh, on the workshop. Right, but after you and I discuss it. Of yeah, course. we'll we'll chat about yeah. it. And then so, we'll... everybody, just keep checking back on uh, Kent Memorial Library's website. Hey, Celeste. Hey, Celeste is from Houston. She is a terrific playwright, let me just tell you, an award-winning playwright, a fantastic playwright. Yeah, <laughs> and you, those stories of yours, I mean, those, I, I knew those people. They were my relatives. The Rosary, I, I know. <laughs> those were my parents. <laughs> and that's when I found out, when I read that book, I, that story, I found out that I was a peculiar immigrant to my family. So. Yeah, the oddball. We became writers. Yes. Celeste, um, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, I loved every moment of it. Thank you. And there's Lenny. She's here too. Wait, who's this? Remember Lenny, my friend Lenny from New York, the director that did Green. Oh, Wars. yes, yes. Oh, there you are. I'm Lenny, oh, yeah, I remember. Look well, at by the way, I loved being in that little workshop where you were, where you were, you know, talking to the actors and making them work on scenes on Celeste's play. Oh my gosh, I felt thank like you. I learned so much just by listening to you. Oh my goodness! Well, thank you very much. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Lenny. I appreciate it. It's a little late, but you know. So should we? Should I?